Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Lakewood City Council study session in the city of Lakewood, Colorado on June 4th, 2018 at 7 p.m. in council chambers. Will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Johnson? Here. Vincent? Here. Rita? Here. Franks? Here. Royball? Here. Goodwine? Here. Skilling? Harrison? Here. Abel? LeBeer? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. So before we get started tonight, I just want to express um, a little bit of sadness amongst this group. One of our colleagues and friends, Councillor Abel, is not with us tonight due to the loss of his wife this past week. So we want to send our best, our thoughts and prayers to him and to his family and certainly let them all know that we're here for them and certainly anything we can do to please let us know. So um, we spend a lot of time together and as you can imagine, that's quite quite sad and uh, we wish him all the best so with that um, I'm just going to take a moment here and just remember our, our our colleague and think about what he uh, him and his family are going through so please join me all right thank you very much so we have two things on our agenda. We have item three, which is uh, part two of municipal funding and item four, which is a proposed council agenda item. That proposal was actually Councillor Abel's proposal. So with his, um, with his okay, we're gonna move that to um, June 11th, Ms. Hodson. So we wanna make sure that we have that posted for next Monday. Uh, yes, thank you. I spoke to the city clerk about it earlier. So we will continue that conversation. So we'll mark that off, off of our agenda for this evening. And then I'll call uh, our city treasurer, Larry Dorr down. And while he's coming down, we have public comment, public input at city council study sessions. And it's a three minute deal, just like regular public comment. But this is different in that this is your opportunity to pretend like you're up here and ask questions so as mr door is presenting to us i'd encourage you to think of any questions and that'll be your opportunity to um, participate after the presentation good evening good evening mr mayor members of city council once again larry door city of lakewood finance director and city treasurer well the title for tonight's agenda item is part two municipal funding and there are likely members of the audience uh, here in chambers or watching at home who maybe haven't been, had a chance to participate in part one or uh, some of our budget and audit committee meetings. Uh, we've had a few public meetings on this subject and so let me just sort of catch everybody up to date and bring some context and then I'll just jump into the subject and I'll be available to answer questions that the public might have or that you may or members of city council may have. At Council's 2018 planning session, the Council set forth several goals for itself in the coming years, and one of them is listed here, which is identify strategies to pay for community needs. And the City of Lakewood staff and administration, we've been embracing these goals since the time of that planning session and working very diligently to have all of the things that we do integrate into those Council goals. and. Uh, no surprise and and to that end we really embarked on this subject of municipal funding as an outcome of your goal identify strategies uh, to pay for community needs at our study session which was really municipal funding part one on april 2nd i covered a number of things i talked about uh, you know, all manner of uh, municipal finance. I bought, brought some reference items and, and offered just sort of a one-on-one on where does the city get its money, what, is, what does it spend its money on, um, what are some of the tools uh, out there for leveraging current income into legacy or long-term type projects. We talked about pay-as-you-go and certificates of participation and bonding and all manner of, of different financial tools. And then we talked a little bit about the community needs. Uh, I showed a number of uh, examples related to physical infrastructure and uh, buildings, parks, and uh, many different examples of that. And at the result, uh, at the at the end of that uh, presentation, there was a discussion amongst council and then a delegation, an assignment to council's 
uh, Budget and Audit Committee. I'll cover what that assignment was in just a moment in a little more detail, but let me just first describe what the Budget and Audit Committee is. It's made up of three citizens and three council members. Uh, council members Labure, Harrison, and Beda. And that committee met two times and reviewed quite a bit of detail on community needs and opportunities to fund those needs uh, and, and now is prepared to have this part two of municipal funding here tonight. And in your packet was quite a bit of information. I wanted to include a lot of the presentation materials that the committee reviewed at its uh, two meetings and uh, kind of some of the related work papers in detail. And I know that I won't be recovering those exact details here again tonight. That'd be repetitive, but I do have them present at a high level, and of course we can refer to them as we go about uh, the discussion tonight. So let me just overview uh, what was assigned to the committee and what they covered on those two dates uh, in May. Uh, the idea was for the committee to review potential projects and programs, really community services that we provide uh, every day, but at an increased level, uh, or in such a manner that would reduce uh, inefficiencies um, and that are not in the city's current capital improvement plan. And, you know, I really want to highlight that just because that's some jargon that uh, our, the, the staff and the, the council members might use, but those in the public should know we have a, a capital improvement plan that's a really substantial part of our budget. It has a, it's over 40 pages. It has its own tab in the back, and it describes all the projects that the city will undertake in the coming budget year plus four more years. And so we, it, it shouldn't be any project that we're already planning to do, but it should be something that would be new and different or something that might not be done for five or 10 years or more. And then of course, a focus on really our core services. We don't wanna to try to propose anything that's outside of our core competency as, an, as a government agency, but something that we're already doing. So obviously public safety, parks, facilities and transportation. So all of the ideas, all of the proposals, and we think all of that links back to really council's goal, uh, identify strategies to pay for community needs. So then as a part of that, the idea was to assess the feasibility of funding those projects and programs at a greater degree of detail. Uh, no sense uh, talking about all these uh, needs, wants, and desires if they're really unrealistic or just not even suitable for the Lakewood community in terms of uh, over-leveraging, overreaching, overspending as it was, some things that could be uh, generally feasible. And then the committee made a, uh, came up with a recommendation. And uh, I'll, I'll have, there'll be time rather for those council members who served on the committee to you know, bring that to light in their own voice. And we did have the three citizen members of the committee participate in both meetings and they could have some feedback uh, for you here as well. So with that, I just want to give some additional information to council and the public uh, at our municipal funding uh, uh, meetings and also at our uh, budget and audit committee. I estimated the city's Tabor refund to be about 8.8 .8 million, and that was reported at your planning session on February 17th. Uh, since then, however, the city has had its books and records audited. That's required under the city charter, and that audit was conducted by Anton Collins Mitchell, and we revised that estimate once the city staff had a chance to go further into the details. As you know, our Tabor calculation is fairly complicated. Actually, it's very complicated, quite honestly. it has. We have geographic exemptions. We have revenue stream exemptions. And uh, so when we really nailed down the number as a staff, the number was $12,536,504. And uh, that number was reviewed by our external auditors and confirmed. We had a conservative estimate. That's uh, probably not surprising. That's generally in our nature. And frankly, what drove that change is uh, quite a significant amount of hail uh, permits, uh, construction tax, and also replacement vehicles. So I wanted to put that in the mix. So a part of the recommendation to, or the requirement, the assignment to the Budget and Audit Committee was to divide, generally speaking, uh, these programs and projects into three tiers or three buckets, if you will, uh, and see what is feasible at each level. And this first bucket, tier one, as you can see, generally fell out across safe community quality living environment. Those are council's core community values, by the way. Safe communities, obviously, across our 
police uh, department and our municipal courts that's that's the function that uh, they're providing quality living environment generally is our community resources department parks recreation uh, older adult services things like that uh, and then third quality transportation uh, options our budget not a committee really wanted to see these linked to goals or the core values and quality transportation options shook out at about 4.4 million. They're generally uh, evenly divided, and I think that was uh, a good outcome. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, the funding source is very, very close to the Tabor refund amount, so clearly the funding source would be a Tabor vote in November 2018 with projects and programs implemented in 2019. Now, I'll list here, particularly for those in the public who maybe didn't see Council's packet or weren't a part of you know, any of the earlier meetings, but I've got here in summary uh, some of the public safety items. I, I shouldn't say some. These are all of the public safety items, and they include a couple of things. They re include recurring costs of additional police agents, but also some one-time costs such as uh, uh, vehicles or uh, hardware, those kinds of things. So you see a mix here, and that connects to the dollar amount. Uh, also in uh, this tier one related to a Tabor vote would be parks and the committee really I think zeroed in on a few things first replacing sort of what we've got uh, you know in a couple of these uh, playgrounds uh, the equipment can date to the 1960s which I think is a good vintage quite honestly uh, <laughs> But uh, others to the 1980s, you know, quite frankly. So, um, you know, but we're due to replace some of those. And they will not be replaced in the current capital improvement plan. They would only be replaced if this uh, Tier 1 was undertaken. And then park development. The community, ha we have many parks in Lakewood that don't have... Uh, the number of shelters, uh, picnic tables that the community might like. We heard about that in our Imagine Lakewood uh, outreach uh, survey uh, that was uh, undertaken extensively in hundreds and hundreds of households across Lakewood last year. So uh, not only would we be taking care of and replacing what we've got, but adding amenities like uh, parking and shelters, uh, some restrooms and so forth. And I've got some things listed. The other thing that we heard in Imagine Lakewood is that uh, year-round restrooms are appreciated in the community. They're, they're very much uh, enjoyed. And we've got one at Carmody Park, and it's, it's proven to get some very, very good feedback uh, from the community. Uh, and there would be more proposed under this Tier 1. And then last but not least is transportation. You know, the city has uh, done a number of transportation studies and examined needs to address both pedestrian mobility, uh, both crossing uh, vehicle traffic and then of course uh, in, on sidewalks and so forth and then vehicle traffic of course through turn lanes and you know widening and so forth uh, and then we would be able to advance some additional traffic signals that wouldn't be you know in our plans uh, through our through our current capital improvement plan um, and then that that primarily was Union Corridor the intersections that you see and then our downtown Lakewood connectivity plan and then finally a sidewalk program program and fusion uh, was proposed. You know, we have a list of tens of millions of dollars of sidewalk requests uh, from members of the community, and we are funding that at one level, and this would add to that. So in a nutshell, uh, that was Tier 1, and that would be uh, able to be funded via a Tabor vote uh, this November. Tier 2, you could see it starting to get larger, uh, right, from $12 million to an additional $40 million, and I think that the committee uh, did some very good due diligence around this, and the project list is extensive. I'll just kind of click through it, but I think you've got the detail, uh, and primarily focused on parks, recreation, community resources, and then public works transportation options, and uh, a funding source from that would be not only a Tabor vote, but bonds or certificates of participation. And I know that, you know, this due diligence, obviously, that, that takes it a step further, uh, but that's what would be necessary to get these, both these Tier 1 projects and Tier 2. The city's done this before uh, in 1998 and 2000, and so we, we have had some experience. We know how to do those and could be done for the next generation of, of folks in, in Lakewood uh, if desired. Um, and I, there's no way I can read through all of these. They're all very large projects in a variety of different places across the community. 
So I'll just give folks a chance to skim that. But you can see that just alone here in parks, recreation, and community resources, the, the amount would be greater than all uh, of a Tabor boat uh, activity. Uh, this is actually page two of that. You add those two together. There are just so many, so many needs and, and so many interests across the community that I, the numbers get really, really large. Um, and so uh, you can see how these all sort of bundle together. Yet there's still similar themes. It's just that Addenbrook Park is a lot bigger than, you know, some of the smaller ones I had listed on the earlier slide. Uh, obviously Whitlock Park uh, as well. Um, and then and then next in this mix is the idea uh, not just with transportation but to create some sort of open space land funding uh, type uh, reserve bank um, escrow however you want to call it so that when there are opportunities for the community to purchase open spaces when they become available uh, the community would have funds set aside to consider those types of things and and I think the city's had success in that uh, very much this year uh, in fact probably one of our greatest successes uh, quite frankly uh, and then of course a greater uh, transportation uh, opportunities just kind of building on what was present in the first slide um, let me just back up one there now i did not include the tier three because it's it's very similar sort of more of the same and tier three gets into uh, not just a Tabor vote not just a bonds or COPs but it would it would take a tax increase to fund some of those things and that's kind of where the committee fairly unanimously said no I don't think so Mr. Dorr that's a quite a yeah, that we can do more due diligence there thank you very much but we're not hearing a lot of uh, of interest and rumblings for perhaps those kinds of things in the community, but some of them involve major highway changes like Sixth Avenue and Wadsworth, or you know bridges over Sixth Avenue, things that are you know very very significant. And so the Tier Three uh, projects are uh, available in your packets. We'll still put them up on the website uh, here very shortly. We're to, uh, we're organizing a portal to place all of this information so that a council can really demonstrate its work uh, here um, on behalf of the public related to its goal, um, identifying strategies to pay for community needs. Uh, so the tier three is, is not uh, present tonight in the presentation, but um, it will be uh, out on our web portal. And with that, I just wanna offer one more thing, Mr. Mayor uh, and members of city council. On tonight's agenda, there's also the words stormwater funding, and I want to be sure and address that before I uh, step down here to the tables behind me and answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Jay Hutchison uh, has been present for a couple, or excuse me, at least one discussion recently, and I mentioned this in Municipal Funding Part 1. And uh, since then, and before the title of this uh, uh, study session could change it's become very clear that the stormwater discussion is going to involve several months work on behalf of mr. Hutchison and his staff at your direction to reach out to the property owners and to the community along West Colfax to really understand their interests their needs the impacts to their properties and the impacts to the businesses who are leasing uh, space and doing business out in the corridor. So Mr. Hutchison has about, well, a number of months work to do to determine which, what type of project it could be. And I, uh, as your treasurer, I'm just going to describe it as either underground or an open channel. It's about as good as I can get with that. But once he's, uh, come with a recommendation with feedback from the community for you then i'll come in and uh, assist as well in terms of what financing options or municipal funding options uh, you know might be there for council to consider and that'll impact the timing and ability to phase in or uh, or complete the project in a shorter time horizon so hence no slides tonight on stormwater funding or financing we've got a little bit of work to do and then and then we'll be back on that so with that, Mr. Mayor, um, I will go ahead and um, address any questions, uh, provide any um, additional details, and I'll just uh, step down to the desk behind me, sir. Thank you. All right, so before we get started, um, I'm going to start public input, and I have Miss Jan Poston. I'm sorry, Joan, come on down. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joan Poston, and I am running for uh, 
State Representative for HD23. But I'm here as a citizen to talk a little bit about some things. I'm concerned that you're not addressing Tier 3 publicly at this meeting because that has an element of debrucing with Tabor. But before um, I go, this isn't started. The green button. Hello? Looks like you got some bonus time. <laughs> it's going. Okay, I'm sorry. So um, <coughs> I wanted to talk about how uh, a little while ago, some uh, one of the staff members came um, before you all and talked about um, fees to be get collected on permits for Airbnb um, businesses. And um, I am concerned about this uh, because one, it was staff generated. Two, um, <coughs> this is about people's homes and properties. And one of the most sacred things in the United States is the American dream of having a home. And you cannot even go into a home without a warrant. So to be having a company come in and say, we're going to see what you're doing, we're going to, t to permit you, and we're going to charge you a fee for having people stay in your home, I believe is un-American and not generated by the community. There are only uh, about 350 people that are part of the Airbnb, and this also includes the, um, uh, <laughs> the um, V, vacation rental by owners as well. So <coughs> here's the thing. There's a company who's been going around and telling city councils that no regulation on this is illegal. That is not true. There are many things in the city that are not regulated. And it doesn't make them illegal. Um, I can smoke on my porch if I want to. It's not illegal. I can't smoke next to a restaurant because that is illegal. But with my home, it's a whole different thing. So um, the reason why I think that this is um, not necessary is because um, this company is coming and they say, I will we'll collect it for you and we'll give you a cut. This is not tax and spending. This is fee and spending. And it is the same thing. And it is making people who are doing things in this city feeling like the government doesn't care about who they are and what they're doing. So I think that this is part of the funding that you're looking at, but I don't know because you didn't address tier three. And um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close public input. I'm just gonna address this real quick. I, certainly a, um, tier three wouldn't pertain to any sort of Airbnb. And to explain Airbnb, it's actually been brought forth by the community because of concerns of folks operating Airbnbs. And so the city of Lakewood does have a lodger's tax that anybody who would rent that house would pay. And the government or the city can only charge fees based upon the services provided. So if there was a fee for an application, it would be based upon what staff time or uh, due diligence time would be put into play. So that's what started that conversation and we had the first round, absolutely, and um, that's where we're going. But that is really kind of separate to this other than um, some of the implications of fees that might be collected and what that would do to the Tabor refund if it would come in and go right back out or the lodger's tax. So I, I encourage you to stay tuned on those conversations as we move forward and there'll be a public process with Airbnb, Airbnb as well. All right, so we have a lot of questions. I'm gonna start, if we could start with uh, one or two questions, that would be fantastic. And Larry, I just want a little history here. So within the last four years, what would be the total if you include this 12.5 that the city has uh, or will be refunding total? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one moment. So for 2013 through 2017, the total amount would be 29.4 million. Okay. 
And the process for refunding started out when it was low through stormwater utility. Was that when it was probably under $5 million? I think it was right on about uh, 1.2, 1.3 million. Yeah. Okay. And then when it grew beyond the stormwater utility fund, it went to property tax and stormwater. Just a prop, a temporary right. reduction in the property okay. tax. Yeah. And so now, because we collect about nine million dollars a year in property tax, we will exceed our property tax. So we'll essentially count, count, cancel out all of our property tax. And then what would you anticipate using, which I think is a challenge, to cover the other $3.5 in refunding? You know, I'm analyzing that at the moment in terms of what could be the most expedient, inexpensive way to refund that difference. Um, working with my staff, we're talking to others across the state about the most expeditious way to do that. You know, the city has collects other taxes that are in that range that, uh, you know, could be adjusted, uh, terminated, temporarily reduced. Uh, you mentioned the city's uh, lodgers tax that could be under consideration, uh, franchise fees that uh, the city assesses and other things in order to bridge that gap and, and uh, make sure that those funds are, are refunded. But now that we know the number and we'll know our, uh, we know our assessed valuation, we need to evaluate that to determine the most efficient and effective way to do that. Of course, council Council will approve that, uh, but I'll naturally have some recommendations. So potentially the lodger's tax was approved by the citizens. Of course. So then that could potentially be suspended due to the need to do refunds through through the, the Tabor process. Yes, that's one of a few ideas that uh, we're contemplating in our due diligence to try to you know, best understand the most efficient, uh, cost-effective way to make this uh, Tabor refund for, for the community. Uh, the idea is to have it uh, be returned in some form or fashion to those who've paid the tax. Mm -hmm. So last question for now, before I move on, who pays or who receives the refund? Just residents, residents and businesses? How does that work? Sure. Well, uh, taxpayers uh, would re receive the refund, and of course, there's a, that's a broad definition. I think many of us think of it as local residents uh, within Lakewood, but of course, visitors uh, pay taxes to the city uh, when they purchase things. They pay sales tax. Visitors pay sales taxes. Of course, property owners, uh, commercial and residential property owners who don't live in Lakewood or vote in Lakewood, they would receive part of the tax refund because they pay taxes. We've been doing that for a number of years through property tax and well, onward of about 55% of the property tax that the city collects is from commercial property owners. Uh, so that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of the mix, but it wouldn't be possible to refund or, you know, sort of rebate to those who visit the community. Obviously, we, we don't know who they are. That's more, tr that's more challenging. But the breakdown's about 55, 45. So from property owners at 45 to 55% of business, and that's large and small businesses, in-state, out-of-state, because it's anybody who would pay a property tax. Yeah, if they're on the Jefferson County Assessor's property tax rolls and, and they're um, require, required to pay, a city property tax and they they would receive the refund that's what we've been doing from 2013-14 okay on mm -hmm. great thank you so i did two to three so let's go with two to three questions ms vincent um i had already asked you this question and so you know i'd be bringing it up tonight and you gave me some information um where would the last mile um input be on this tier one or tier two thank you counselor let's see um you know, first, all spending, of course, is approved by the city council. And so a uh, city council is the only uh, uh, group that can approve the city's budget and spending. I think these tiers and these various concepts, these various projects are, um, at this point, hypothetical. I mean, they're, they're very robust. They're, they're not, um, um, you know, uh, they're very well defined and very thoughtful. And I think that the staff from the police chief, public works director, and community resources director. They believe that these are the projects that can have the greatest impact for the community. Um, but obviously at some point or another in the future, 
uh, when uh, things are either if there's a vote or voted up or what what have you. I think it's there's an opportunity for council to, as a whole, review all of the projects proposed in any of the tiers. Um, the the council's budget, not a committee, have looked at those and and feel that that's the generally speaking, I think the right mix that can have the greatest amount of impact. So, uh, Councilor Vincent is uh, describing a last mile connectivity, which means the last mile of connectivity to the light W rail stations in Lakewood, meaning sidewalks, lighting, and other things. So uh, certainly there could be some other mix of, you know, proposals at some point down, down the road, but that might be step three or four or five. And I think we're at step one or so at the moment. If that's it would have to be flushed out then, um, like the million dollars for the sidewalks, we'd have to come up with a piece parts for that. What does that what does that contain? And that's step three and four. I think so. And having done this uh, myself in the past, what would often happen is I, I would envision the city doing a, a, a budget that would not anticipate you know, this being voted up or, or any changes. And then if it were, then council would have the opportunity to, to re-implement those things or describe them in advance of a vote, whatever is necessary. But until such a thing is decided, as you said, it would be step two or three. And, and as I said, it might be step two or three or four, but yeah. Thank you. All right, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I've actually got many questions, but I'll try and stick with three. We can come back. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess first off, we are talking about putting this on the ballot. Is that correct? Well, I think the um, budget and audit committee members should uh, uh, be the ones to describe their recommendation, but that indeed that indeed was the recommendation that um, in order to pay in or a, a strategy to pay for community needs, which was the council goal, um, a strategy to pay for those community needs in tier one would be through a Tabor vote. Okay. Well, this has forced me to go back in some of my old files on Tabor, Larry. And one document I have on it by the Colorado Municipal League from 15, so it's a little old. Um, but in there, it was talking about multi-year um, the Tabor limits multiple fiscal year obligations, correct? Correct. Okay. Some of these look to me like they're more than one year type obligation. Yeah, uh, let me address that. So, for example, the city has a finance director and city treasurer. Uh, you know, each year uh, those monies have to be appropriated. All all appropriations lapse, uh, you know, as a function of the Lakewood City Charter. Um, but without a doubt, uh, you know, that can be done. On, these things can be done under the auspices of Tabor. But clearly, um, if it's decided by some future council that, you know, we're going to get down, we're going to have our last 10 police agents, then, then these would be the ones. So I don't foresee any of those things happening at all. Uh, but these can be done under Tabor. Council shouldn't overcommit. Uh, shouldn't commit to, um, you know, funding 20 or 30 or 50 police agents, but it can be done reasonably. And that's one of the things that the committee looked at very carefully uh, to make sure that um, the council wouldn't be over-promising to the community. But yes, uh, this does not constitute a multiple fiscal year obligation. Right. Since you brought up the police, um there was an interest in 10 police agents, one sergeant, six vehicles, four investigative technicians, five community service officers. I just need to understand something. The police academy is struggling to get enough folks to even go to it. So this is really pretty aspirational. Well, no, uh, you know, we have, the city has added to its police numbers uh, over by 21 in just the last four years and we certainly have a greater number of staff today than we did four years ago now it law enforcement recruiting is challenging it's challenging nationwide and we're working very hard on it 
Um, but we certainly have more officers than we did four years ago, and we will continue to scale up. So should, should 10 police agents be added, I, I can say very confidently that we will reach full staff. And there have been times in the city's past when we've had a number of agents slightly greater uh, than the authorized strength, and sometimes when we've had fewer, no doubt, um, and those tend to average themselves out over time. That's our goal. That's how we're managing police headcounts, and uh, we'll continue to do that. We also, uh, once upon a time, only had one police academy per year. We now have two, so we can continue to have a regular, ongoing recruitment process. So I feel confident, as is our chief, that we can achieve those numbers. So we are replacing the officers that retire or that leave? Indeed. Okay, because I'm getting different mixed messages from different places that we um, were struggling with that. Okay, also this uh, muni Colorado Municipal League document talks about demographics that matter, and it certainly applies to Lakewood. It says, um, as, again, this is from 15, but it says during the next 15 years, the aging of a population will, and Lakewood is aging, uh, change the housing mix, likely dampening growth in housing values and the property tax base, change income and spending patterns, likely dampening growth in the income and sales tax bases, and that, that to me makes sense, and increased demand for government services, applying further budget pressure on governments, and for us I think that's probably more in the transportation Department of Recreation, they have a lot of things that they're offering to seniors. So that's also part of it. And then they were also, in this document, talking about lessons from litigation. And one of them was to stop Stormwater Utility Association versus the Board of County Commissioners of Adams County. Is anybody familiar with that? I've got that apparently it was an enterprise status, the stormwater. Is our stormwater fee an enterprise status? It is an enterprise, yes. That's an accounting and Tabor related term, yes. Okay, so Meaning it's that, would be, that would, would be what this is referring to in the litigation as well, right? Because it was an enterprise type thing. Okay. Um, also, Tabor requires an emergency reserve um, of 3% of spending over the last year, 10 years. Could you please tell us what our reserves are at this point? Sure. Well, thank you. First, regarding the financial concerns that uh, you've expressed and identified, uh, Certainly, those are things that are on all of our minds as we do our strategic financial planning and our forecasting for the future. There's certainly a change in demographics. I, I'm just thinking back to the presentation I made at last year's budget study session regarding the change in consumer behaviors and all of these things we're seeing related to you know, the, the Amazon Corporation and so forth. I also want to say, however, though, that the city has weathered financial storms like the Great Recession. And you will recall that during the 2008 to 2012 period, the city was able to weather that recession without any furloughs, without any layoffs. We didn't uh, terminate any capital projects. Uh, and in fact, we, we maintained our, our emergency reserves during that Great Recession. And uh, also, we've had this great hail experience in the last uh, 13 months now, uh, where we've lost, I, I estimate probably it'll be nearly $4 million uh, in revenue during that period of time. Um, our reserves are $30 million, and uh, that's uh, five to six, to, well, many times more than the minimum required under Tabor. In fact, council very conservatively has a 10% emergency reserve, and uh, we're more than double that uh, at the moment. Uh, so we have a, a very strong uh, reserve. We also uh, paid down nearly $6 million in debts uh, last year. So I think this uh, city is on very firm uh, financial ground, and uh, certainly nobody can protect the, uh, uh, predict the future. Nobody can, uh, but I think uh, we have experience dealing with changes and uh, evolution and uh, uh, this coming change in demographics uh, quite well. 
Well, currently the economy, the way that I'm understanding it, is pretty robust. It's doing well right now. Do you have any type of forecast indications as far as what, how that will be reflected in the reserves in our next budget? No, I don't have any forecast for that. You know, the city has experienced a recession every decade in its, in its history. Uh, and there will be another one for sure. Uh, but we remain poised as a management team to respond to those changes in financial condition. We've, we've dealt with uh, the internet bubble. We've dealt with September 11th. Uh, we've dealt with the online shopping and we'll continue to deal with those business cycles. We expect them and we're at the top. No, few people would uh, disagree with that, but I think we're well prepared. We will not be forecasting in 2019, uh, you know, necessarily any kind of recession, maybe a slowing in growth and we'll continue to monitor what the state, um, uh, the state economists and forecasters will say, but um, but no, I'm not anticipating any immediate downturn. Certainly that could occur. Uh, nobody can predict the future, uh, but I think we're very well poised to be responsive to that. Okay, just one last comment for right now. We have certificates of deposit, I believe, for City Hall, right? Some of the infrastructure when do you anticipate those to be paid off and then also at Belmar um, the PIFs that are out there when do we expect for that to end and so that we would go to a more normal structure there sure uh, well just the first part of your question let me address there are two things um, you said certificates of deposit Is that and correct or do I have my terminology it's, <laughs> it's certificates of participation Sorry. Yep, oh, and which is the COPs. Right, and what did uh, I say certificate of deposit. Of deposit. Okay. Yeah, we have those too, but those are on the better side of the ledger. That's always what I yeah. tell my husband, so that's how it works. <laughs> we uh, have quite a few of those, in fact. Anyhow, Husbands. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the certificates of participation be paid off uh, in December of 2020 for the Civic Center. So that's just right on the horizon to a, a you know, pr a, financial forecaster really. And uh, the PIFs will discontinue. And let me just describe that for those in the audience. But uh, at Belmar, the city has waived two thirds of its sales tax in order to facilitate the redevelopment of the old Villa Italia Mall, uh, which had to be torn down. Um, and, and as a function of that, the city reduced its sales tax. The sales tax will return to its higher level uh, in 2028. 2028? Correct. Okay, so we've still got 10 years. Yep. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For now. Mr. Royball. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, I have a couple of questions, and I want to go back to um, the refund. And you had talked a little bit about stormwater and talked about uh, property tax. And I want to touch bases with stormwater and kind of recap a little bit. The stormwater is being charged to all the uh, – uh, owner properties in the city of Lakewood, including the school districts, the uh, nonprofit government, uh, all the buildings. And when we talk about Tabor uh, and and the refund, uh, the nonprofits do they get the rebate or are they exempt from that rebate? The one time that we've done that, they did not receive the rebate. Okay, and then again with the property tax. Uh, the nonprofits um, would not uh, receive any rebates from Tabor if, they, there, if there was a refund because they didn't give property tax? That's a little more complicated. I would just say it this way. Uh, not all nonprofits are treated the same by the Jefferson County Assessor. There are some that do pay property tax. So let me just say it simply. Anybody who pays in a property tax will receive a credit for the refund okay makes sense okay it does make sense I just wanted to clarify that and wanted to make sure um, you know not just you know all the homeowners just get full property like for example the school district would they get a stormwater rebate or a Tabor rebate uh, for stormwater no okay and then same thing with property tax 
they don't pay into property tax, so they would not be entitled to uh, a rebate. Correct. Okay. Okay. That's all I have for now. Thanks. Ms. Franks. Um, what is the um, annual estimated revenue that we get from the stormwater? Um, what do we pull in from, from the, fee the fees, roughly? I mean, it doesn't be exact. Sure. I, I'm, I'd... I might prefer to just quickly look at oh, my sure. look at my budget if you wouldn't mind. I can be a little more precise. Five point five or six. Five and a half, six million, somewhere in there. If that if that's close enough, I'll. Oh, that that's fine, absolutely. And I guess the line of questioning when I was out campaigning, and then I've had some folks follow up. There there is a group of folks who believe that the um, stormwater fee is a tax that um, circumvents kind of the Tabor structure in that. But what I'm trying to understand is, I'm not saying whether that is or isn't, I'm just simply saying the impact of not having that $5 million, knowing that that doesn't cover the needs for stormwater, where would those funds, would we be talking the general fund? I guess I just want to try to understand if, if we say that that goes away. Yeah. then it becomes a general fund, a budget um, experience each year where we then pick the projects and pick and choose. Is that what happens? Let me just describe it this way. Um, the stormwater fund itself will not be impacted in any way. It's just a, it's just a tool that allows for the, the refund to be made. So just think of it as it's almost, I hate to say it this way, but if you think about it really as a mailing list, uh, that, that's really how it would work. The stormwater fund itself as an enterprise will be financially whole as if it were to receive all of the funding from the Tabor refund. It will just receive that funding uh, indirectly from the general fund and, and others who were over the Tabor limit, if I can say that real simply. I think I was meaning the other direction. If it, we were to ever do away with the enterprise fund, what would be that impact just because I'm hearing from folks in the community where they are concerned that it w it is something that uh, should not have been created and I'm not speaking to whether I believe that to be true or not I'm just trying to become educated and say what if that were to go away and we know that the funds don't already cover the projects that are needed in those areas and admit admitted that you have to prioritize help me understand that impact would that be that we would have to look more heavily at debrucing does that mean we'd have to raise sales tax i'm just trying to understand because money has to come from somewhere to do these things so can you speak a little bit to that i think it would probably be a mix of things and certainly our public works director is far better equipped mm -hmm. to answer than i would but uh, in studying his uh, presentations on the subject i think he's described it as the city would probably only be able to reasonably undertake those requirements that are federally mandated. So I think that has to do with water quality and things like that, but it wouldn't be able to uh, install additional facilities, meaning more drainage culverts, ditches, or not ditches, but culverts and piping and all of that, because those projects would then have to compete with things like for councils funding uh, really with things like playgrounds and um, you know police radios and other capital needs across the entire city and it, it would be difficult to have uh, many of those sort of bubble up to the surface if I can say that um, so I think that's uh, certainly something that you know our, our public works director could describe but yeah, no, I don't know if that necessarily has to do with part two of municipal funding or how those services could be provided necessarily. But uh, yeah, certainly, as you said, fewer things would get done. Okay. And, and that helps. And I apologize for not getting these questions out earlier. Um, I had an email come in late yesterday, which I just read today, and I wanted to at least ask a couple of those questions. I'll follow up with, uh, with uh, Ms. Hodgson later. Perfect. And, and let me add that that's a great question because there is some confusion about enterprise funds and our two enterprise funds are our golf course and our stormwater. And essentially, if you did away with the enterprise, then you'd be pushing everything that the enterprise fund does now into the general fund. So that would become part of our whole capital conversation during budget times. Whereas when it is an enterprise fund, which has been upheld by this, the Colorado Supreme Court, as a legal fee, um, 
that money that is collected for that utility can only be used for that utility. So you can't mix general fund dollars. You can There's a small threshold, maybe 10% or less, that you can mix from outside sources. So it's really a user fund that pays for the direct usage and direct fees associated with it. So that, that helps clarify it. So if it did go away, it would just be uh, something else that we'd be looking at trying to find the revenues for in this group here during budget time through the general fund. Ms. Gutwein. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for this presentation um, and all for all the work from all the departments to get us good information about this and also to the committee um, for the time that it took to go through all of this information. And I think that these tiers that you've presented um, really hit the community needs that I hear a lot um, about community safety and about parks and transportation. Um, and then, so I just want to ask a couple of questions about, um, I think when we, when we have this conversation, people want to know, well, what's my refund going to be? At the end of the day, what, how much are people going to see in their pockets or in, the, in their property tax? So could you walk through just for someone who's maybe listening to the first time, um, how much they would potentially get uh, on their property tax and, and how they would get that money. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, I had the number up here, which is $12,536,504. I've said that number a lot of a lot lately, and so I've recalled that. I mean, if you if you divide that by 150,000 residents, you could, as a thumbnail, you know, do that math very very quickly, and it's just less than a hundred dollars per per resident. But that's very diff that's impossible, really, because residents are moving into Lakewood today, and the residents are moving out of Lakewood today. That's very very difficult, uh, you know, to to make sure that that money is going to get into each of those folks' hands. Uh, then, in the case of property tax, it's all relative to the amount of the value of your property. So, if I have a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home in Lakewood, and that's a, that would probably be a typical size. I might have a hundred dollar. Uh, rebate in my in my property tax, but if if you have a five hundred thousand dollar home, you would get double that because you would have paid more in and created a larger refund. Um, commercial properties, you should know, are assessed at four times the rate uh, that a residential home is. So if I have a hundred thousand dollar residence, uh, or excuse me, if I have a hundred thousand dollar commercial property, I would pay as much property tax as you would if you had a $400,000 home. So commercial properties will be would be receiving the, the largest share of the refund or, or just use a factor of four really. And that's why about 55% of the property tax collected from the city comes from commercial properties and, and those could be international corporations or local residents who own their own small business and the property inside of it. So um, and of course, our, our uh, residential you know, stormwater fee is, uh, I think most people are familiar with it, it's in the $40 range, if I have that right. So it's a complicated question and uh, not avoiding the answer, but it's very difficult to estimate what it could mean to people. But hopefully that gives folks a general idea. And of course, there are going to be people in the community who are renting an apartment or renting a home and they might not directly share uh, in the property tax. Uh, portion of the refund. So it's imperfect, uh, unfortunately, uh, but uh, something that we're working on to try to have some additional, something in addition to the property tax that could uh, help others along the way. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an yeah, idea. That, that definitely helps. So I just want to clarify then. So if you rent, you will not be getting a share of the, of the refund, essentially. Essentially. Okay. Okay, great. And then, um, well, I mean, that's not great for people who rent, but thank you for the answer. <laughs> um, and uh, and then, so our businesses or commercial properties see about 55% and then the remaining is the property owners. Right. Okay. So I think that if we continue this conversation, I think it would be really great if we could have some kind of informational sheet um, on the website that just breaks down, mm -hmm. even if it's just a ballpark, um, so that people know, okay, it's, you know, maybe it's between 40 and $90. 
um, that I could see back in my property tax, um, or I could see, you know, some of these amenities in the community. Um, just so that, because we get into a lot of jargon really quickly, and I think that um, it's a pretty complex issue. And so at the end of the day, you know, how much money is it? And, and, and what are what are your options? Um, and then that was my other question. I'm not sure who to direct this to, but what what kind of public input process we can have um, and or what we can do in the amount of time that we have. So I think that it would be really great if we could get more information from the community about what what of these projects they would like to see. And I'm, I'm just not even sure if I should direct that to. I'll help Thank you. with that. Um, yes, yeah, so our intent is to put as much information on the website as possible so that um, people can learn in as uh, with as much depth as they're interested. The other thing we've talked about as a staff is to put together um, a non-scientific kind of uh, survey to reach out to the community and have people uh, indicate to you what's important to them and what if indeed there was a uh, deeper scene in the city how would they want those dollars to be used and or is that something that they are very opposed to the deeper scene so we would have kind of an open in open-ended kind of survey um, but people would need to opt in and, and fill that out we can also do a piece on looking at Lakewood and we'll just uh, provide you also with as many handouts as as you're interested in so that as you go out and have your ward meetings or visit with your constituents that information is available wonderful um, okay I think that's the only questions I have for now and then uh, I have comments I guess for later thank you Ms. Harrison <laughs> thank you um, I think in presentations that I've seen um, about um, the Tabor that there we've had it about 30 years correct since 1992 if I remember right um, and but since then there have been a lot of municipalities that have chosen to I'll use D Bruce as the terminology is there a large amount that have chosen to do that and what do they know that we don't let's see um, I'm not sure what they know that we don't as I think like to think we're pretty well informed um, let's see many many other cities including Lakewood Lakewood has had four Tabor votes in its history and all four were uh, voted yes uh, so the city of Lakewood itself has experience with that yet we're still here because the city has had a variety of votes on Tabor that either expired or were for specific things uh, so we're, we're back uh, to talking about it but um, many many front range cities are peers that uh, have residents similar to Lakewood um, they have had similar votes many of whom have had uh, they've completely relieved the Tabor revenue limitations altogether um, and I, I would say it's the majority have done that uh, yes so our neighbors to the north including you know Wheat Ridge and uh, Arvada and Westminster and Thornton and so forth they've they've done that so um, uh, and Golden and Denver and Aurora and lots of other municipalities I think um, in my research Lakewood Loveland Longmont and Littleton the L cities and Colorado Springs. and Colorado Springs are about the only remaining cities still functioning within Tabor or using Tabor as a as a vehicle let me put it that way correct to your knowledge correct and I should add though that many uh, the majority of the functions of Tabor are still in place uh, in other cities and would be still in Lakewood such as a tax increase would have to be voted upon the emergency reserve requirement would still be present it's just the revenue limitations when you speak of other cities and across the front range and so forth and as you said it's easier to describe the ones who haven't done anything right. so that's what I was thinking um, one of the things that um, I want to go back to stormwater for just a minute I remember um, a discussion I believe at CML last year that talked about that Colorado Springs as I remember withdrew 
or dis, um, disbanded their stormwater fee. Um, and then later, I think it was about a year later, is when we had the big flood. And they had real financial difficulties because they had given away that money, so to speak, and then had an infrastructure need that had to be redone. And it was very crushing financially for them. So I would want us to keep that in mind if we would decide to do anything like that. I'm, I'm hoping that we would not. Um, for me, can I give an opinion now or I'm done? Are you still doing questions? Yeah, we still have questions if that's okay. okay that's we fine. Keep going I'll wait. Thank you. So, Mr. Dorr, as far as kind of the, the list that you laid out, um, how does that break down between additional funding versus one time? Clearly, the, the new personnel would be additional funding. And what I'm getting to is, you know, it's going to be 12.5 this year. Potentially, it's going to be something next year. Five years from now, it could be nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we ensure that, you know, we have that balance to, as to ongoing um, obligations that we can make sure that that they're funded and they're taken care of thank you I think this also goes to uh, some of the things that Councillor Johnson uh, mentioned as well um, we've had success being conservative as a community I would just say that fiscally conservative and um, and that is true here in this case as well and to give a little idea to the ratio of numbers yes while the number is 12 536 504 uh, we think that uh, in our estimates that the it would probably trend right at about four million a year and that means if the city's revenue were to merely grow at an, a comparable amount allowed under Tabor uh, that the refund would be right on about four million a year plus or minus a little bit um, and so the idea would be it would it would not be conservative at all to make long-term commitments now we can't make multiple fiscal year obligations but when you hire a police officer you're making a commitment to that level of service to the community and to that individual for their career i think we all understand that but it doesn't constitute a multiple fiscal year obligation so the idea that the committee really dug into understanding the real feasibility of this long term because it would be um, imprudent to make commitments of four or five million dollars in permanent you know new police hires or whatever the case may be if we only are going to have a Tabor refund of onward of about four million so the idea is that the the long-term commitments those community service officers sergeants and uh, police agents were onward of about two million and so even if the refund decreased in a recession you know from four to two the city would still have the funding to continue that level of service to the public thank you for that and talking about the trend what would make the trend flip financially or um, going out into the future what what kind of event would cause us to be back in the position without touching the Tabor uh, limitations to have that flip to where we're not issuing refunds yeah well the only thing is a recession uh, or if council chose to uh, you know I don't know terminate a sales tax uh, or some other such thing that would be very dramatic uh, but certainly a recession you know interestingly however without the Tabor revenue limitations the city would be able to recover from a recession and would have the funding to sort of uh, continue on with those services in fact it's not coincidental if you notice that during the Great Recession the city had no Tabor refunds this wasn't anything interesting or anything really to deal with but as soon as the economy became much stronger uh, then uh, the city began to have its Tabor refunds starting immediately after the recession and they've continued to grow and for all intensive purposes our, our debt load as a city entirely is about what percent Oh, I, I think the annual payments as a percentage of income is what that's what you typically look at uh, you know if you want to individually borrow money for a mortgage the the mortgage company will look at your your annual debt service versus your meaning payments versus your annual income and they'll, they'll make you a home loan if your debt service is 30 to 40 percent of your income at the city it's you know less than three percent debt load so it's very very small with major debts being retired in the next for four years or so through our COP retirement. Correct. Okay. 
And then lastly, uh, as a question, Amazon, we fought hard. We're continuing to fight for sales tax to uh, equalize with our brick and mortar. And we've had um, reporting or, or readmittance by companies like Amazon. So in the flow of things, as a city that's dependent on sales tax for its operations, when we add new businesses or create an opportunity such as Amazon, does that money just kind of coming right back in and then going right back out? I'm not sure I understand the question, but I... I... So as we create new revenue, which is the goal of a city that's dependent on sales tax... Yeah. Right, we have very low property tax, mm -hmm. and we're built on sales tax. So, economic development is a big thing; it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So, we are continuing to go and create economic development opportunities through small businesses, large businesses. But at the point we're at now, when we add those on, or we have Amazon sending us their money back, it's coming here, but we're kind of just washing it right back out. I beg your pardon. Now I understand your question. We're washing it back right back out because of the Tabor right. limitations. So let me give a few more examples of that. I beg your pardon, Mayor. Now I, I, I track you there. So in other words, if uh, Lakewood becomes a, it, it opens a, um, uh, you know, a new retail opportunity for our citizens and our visitors, and that creates great new sales taxes. Well, we're already over our limit. So those funds have to be refunded through Tabor. We can't use that to provide additional community services. Another being if the city were to annex properties uh, into the community and that were to create additional revenue, that would have to be refunded. Um, if the city were to institute new fees for service, again, refunded. Uh, an example of that is um, when the city provided uh, extra duty police services on the light rail for the W line with uh, RTD. Uh, we're collecting money from the RTD for providing those services. We use that money to pay the police officers, but that income from providing that service has to then be re refunded. So it does, the, the problem with that being is that it can create a misperception in the community where the community might sense that the economics of the city are stronger and stronger and stronger and yet the level of services appear to remain the same and that that could create some discon uh, disconnect thank you thank you for that mr Bita. Thank you. thank you mayor uh thank you for your presentation mr door <clears throat> a couple of questions on your tier one projects and programs that you've talked about, public safety, I think there's like nine of them. As I'm understanding it, those are not currently in our budget. Is that correct? I mean, they're not budgeted items. None of the items, public safety, transportation, or parks are in our budget. Mm -hmm. So in the future, if, if we did not detabor, then we'd have to be looking for other ways to fund these, these needs, so to speak. Correct? Indeed. Mm -hmm. Um, and then secondly, uh, on your tier one summary, which is page six of the, of the, um, uh, page six of your, uh, the, the packet, page six of the packet. Gotcha. I'm sorry. You can't hear me. Page six of the packet. I wanted to ask you, there's an, uh, inset in there that I don't understand. It talks about the, uh, property taxes in Tabor versus a uh, yes Tabor versus a no Tabor vote. Mm -hmm. and can you kind of explain that a little bit better to me? Not we, quite sure. sure. We pull that up too, please. Yeah, tier one summary. Madam Clerk, could you uh, bring the agenda packet? Uh, if you could give me a hand with that. Thank you. My thing isn't working very well. <laughs> oh, there it is. Thank you for your patience. I hadn't uh, pulled the packet up. No, it's fine. This will just Let's help the see. folks in the audience and those at home. Let me go ahead and describe uh, what's on this uh, bit of information as uh, the clerk, our city clerk, is uh, pulling up that uh, information. What I wanted to present on this slide, and I can see the council members are having a chance to take a look at it. What I wanted to present was what is really the cash received from property taxes under our current situation uh, or uh, with a Tabor vote? 
And um, so that's what's uh, on its way up. Oh, uh, let's go to discussion and yeah. Thanks, Michelle. That that one. Thank you. I just want to make that a touch bigger for the television audience and those here in chambers, honestly, as well. So uh, what I tried to describe um, is uh, if there were a, a Tabor vote or not, and just to kind of show the cash impact. And um, I think the idea uh, was to uh, first sort of describe in the right-hand column, if there's a Tabor vote, then next year's property tax collections, um, you, you know, w would be as follows uh, here at, um, they would go from 3.3 cash received by the city to 9.1. Um, if there's no Tabor vote, given that the refund has to be 12 million, that's in the middle column, then the cash received by the city would be zero that makes sense that goes to what the mayor was describing in terms of you know we would we would, the city would have a temporary rebate or refund of its entire property tax there would be no t cash received from the assessor to my office okay and then in 2020 the presumption my estimate is that it would return to about its four million dollar refund level so this is our cash in so the bullet reads property tax collections Keep in mind also that property tax collections, you know, right now we're collecting, the assessor is collecting the 2017 property tax for the city right now. And the residents are paying their 2017 property taxes. Okay. How'd that do? Yeah, and then so then what you're saying is, like for 2018, it, whether we detaber or not wouldn't make much of a difference won't make any difference. We're difference. All, we, yeah. But in 19, it would make a $9.1 million difference in revenue to the city. And same thing in, uh, well, the difference between $5 million and $9 million for the year 2020. You got it. That's projected. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got well, it. Plus an additional three and a half plus million in 19. So that just shows priority. Right. That's 9.1. Right. But we have to come up with 12.5. So you'd be looking for three three plus somewhere else correct mayor yeah i'd have to add a column on here that would read for example lodgers tax or some other such thing we've yet to determine i need to i need to do some work on that okay and then if if uh the taxpayers were to, to decide or were to vote to detaber would that result in any tax rate increases automatic or otherwise either property tax mill levy or sales tax is there anything in Tabor that would require that? It would absolutely not increase any tax rates whatsoever. That would take a, that would act that would take an entirely separate vote. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was not recommended by the committee. Okay, Ms. Vincent. Oh, sorry. Thank you. No, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Vincent. Me. Okay. <laughs> um, two questions. Okay. The senior property tax exemption, how does that impact? Uh, well, that's managed by the assessor under state law, of course, and it's not impacted at all. It wouldn't change at all. The seniors would retain uh, whatever entitlements that they are uh, allowed, and that's not impacted. But and then, of course, the refund is a tad smaller for the seniors as well because it's related to what they're paying in. So I guess I can just simply say no impact. Okay, so if somebody under 65 gets $100, then the person 65 and over would get 100. Well, it goes back to what I was describing to council member Gutwein, and that is if I have a $250,000 home and you have a $500,000 home, then you would receive twice the refund. And then that formula if i can describe it that way is the same for the seniors so a senior with a two hundred thousand dollar property pays less in they would get a smaller refund uh and someone 
who's not a senior and has a $250,000 home pays more in, in tax, they would get a greater refund. So it would be proportional. It would, okay, it would be, I had that question asked somebody. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the other question is, when do we have to make a decision to put this on the ballot? Uh, I, I've checked with the, the city clerk has told me that the deadline relates to the requirement for the city to make an intergovernmental agreement with the county clerk who uh, manages the elections. And uh, that has to be done uh, by the 1st of September effectively. So the city council would have to adopt a resolution before that. Uh, and its last meeting in August is on the 27th of August. So uh, to, that, to my mind, that would be the, that would be the deadline. Yeah. Okay, so we'd have to have something in August then to prove putting it on the ballot. But wouldn't there be something before that? Don't we have to have a first and a second? Uh, no, it's a resolution of the city council. So it's just the one meeting and resolutions take effect immediately upon the uh, uh, vote of the city council. So we'd have to make a decision pretty quick. Yes. And, and uh, Mr. Cox, I think I have that correct in terms of the dates and the adoption. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I noticed on tier two, and actually it was on, on the iPad on page eight, there's open space acquisition for six and a half million. And on page nine, this is like I say on the iPad. Um, open space acquisition for seven and a half million. Now, a few weeks ago, we voted on a fee in lieu, and I it was my understanding that the money that would come for that would be going towards parks and open space in that particular region or area. Could you please talk a little bit about what we're doing with this on here? Sure. Uh, let's see. Well, in two tier, different figures for one thing. Indeed. It, tiers two and three uh, were, again, also hypothetical. And because of their greater size, there would be more money to institute an open space um, land bank or land escrow fund or what have you. Um, again, those requiring, um, you know, borrowings from COPs or issuing bonds or increasing uh, taxes and so forth. So um, the idea would be to create money set aside just for the purpose of acquiring land and open space. Um, that would be in addition to what might be received for parkland dedication fees in lieu of land dedication. So it, it, those would be um, additive if I can say it that way, or they would be compound on top of that. So recognizing that that's also one of council's goals, I don't have the words right at my fingertips, but acquisition of parks and open space, I know is a very keen uh, and important goal of the city council. So those would be accumulative on top. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Do we have any land identified at this point for that? I don't believe so, no. In fact, I think the strategic um, vision for that is that it's uh, sensible to evaluate those particular opportunities when they present themselves because then the city's in a greater position to negotiate a fair market value price, uh, you know, for those particular tracts of land or open space. I think that's the strategic, uh, you know, direction. Certainly, the city knows and understands all of the vacant dirt in the community. I think we have a general understanding of that, uh, but it does. It, it wouldn't be fiscally prudent or strategic to sort of open an advertisement in the paper that says that the city has millions of dollars to spend. Oh, I understand that. Somewhere in between. I understand that. So then we would have two funding sources for open space in Parkland. Mm -hmm. Who would be identifying when we would be triggering trying to to purchase that land. I'm just trying to get my hands around that a little bit better. Well, I know that the uh, Community Resources Department has a real keen understanding of 
of land that may become available in the near future. Of course, obviously, our community resources department and uh, city manager Hodson are aware of major opportunities uh, such as the Taylor property and and others that may become available. Uh, so uh, certainly we have an idea of those uh, opportunities as they emerge. Okay. Um, let's see here. Under transportation, and I think it's uh, the Union Area Transportation, it's talking about lanes and um, paths. Do we have any idea where those would be and the number of people that would actually be using that because it's a substantial amount of money? It is, and uh, widening uh, lanes and adding turn lanes is very, very expensive and complicated, of course. Um, yes, our transportation division, they've identified uh, the exact locations for these, and I've presented them in summary format because they're generally, generally hypothetical. Uh, but yes, we have a very keen idea, and I think as this conversation progresses, our transportation um, division and uh, our public works director could provide uh, overhead aerials and uh, an idea of the transportation flow through those lanes. I guess I'm just getting a little concerned because the Union Corridor study was very comprehensive, but I'm not sure that we've got total community buy-in on that because part of it was to, we're talking about widening lanes, but it was also to narrow lanes. So I'm not, I'm not sure where we're going with that. Also, um, there was mention in transportation here regarding the 6th Avenue overpass for the Route Street and Quail. I was my understanding that if anybody built on the Federal Center, that it would be their responsibility to do that. So why are we listing that in here when we've already talked about, you're going to have to talk to me about that. Oh, sure. Yes, certainly. Uh, the tier three, this was a due diligence exercise by the budget and audit committee to understand community needs. And certainly there is a strong interest, I, I believe, in, in congestion in the union corridor, hence the uh, union area uh, transportation study was performed to begin with. Um, and I put on the list the Route Street overpass at 6th Avenue. It became pretty clear to the Budget and Audit Committee right away that the only way to accomplish those Tier 3 type projects, uh, because, you know, again, our, our uh, goal was to identify strategies to pay for community needs. Well, one strategy to pay for that community need is, of course, to have the developer pay for it. But if the community wanted to see it next year or two years from now, the only way to pay for that community need would be through a tax increase. And the committee felt that that was not the right direction for the city. So while this was a due diligence exercise to see how those community needs could mesh into uh, realistic opportunities, uh, for the council and for the community, it, that was pretty quickly abandoned, uh, not just because of the tax increase, but also as you describe, that uh, some future developer, you know, be, may be required to install that. It was my understanding it was kind of hard and fast that the developer would be held their feet to the fire to do that particular project. So I just needed some clarity. Also under Sixth Avenue interchange. Isn't that a CDOT issue? That's not ours. Similar, a similar project with uh, similar circumstances. It certainly would be coordinated and substantially paid for by CDOT. But again, the communities identify that as a need that they, the community might like to see sooner. Uh, and, but again, the only way that can be feasible is through some sort of a city tax increase or to wait until such a time as CDOT might fund such a project. Because... It, I believe that there's substantial interest in transportation. My mic keeps going out. Um, there's different types of looking at that. Uh, so it. Um, and I think that's the reason, again, that that wasn't necessarily a recommendation of the committee. Okay, because it's in here, so you know I need to ask. Also, the Alameda Union intersection—that's all C dot. 
the Sixth Avenue interchange or intersection, isn't that like a $70 million project if I've got my figures right in my head on that? Absolutely. That's what I thought. Okay. Also, could you please talk a little bit about the marijuana tax? How does that interface with Tabor and how much are we getting? What's going on with that? Yeah. So the city has a sales tax on medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. Receipts have gone down double digit percentages uh, each year, reducing the Tabor, the amount that would otherwise be refunded via Tabor because um, consumers of marijuana generally have gravitated toward other communities that have retail marijuana. So the medical marijuana um, businesses in Lakewood are seeing decreases. And I think the annual revenue now is right around 400,000 a year, or maybe a little bit less. Uh, so that has decreased the Tabor refund from what it might otherwise be. So that's how that, that's how that piece functions. It's, it's lumped in with all of the other city sales taxes. Okay. And if this does go to the ballot, it would be in the blue book, correct? Just like everything else. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And do we know now who would be writing the pro for this and who would be writing the con for this? How are those people identified that are going to be putting that information out there? I believe that's done as a function of the county clerk and um, uh, as a part of the ballot writing process, uh, Madam Clerk. That is, that is correct, yeah. Okay. So I, I think the answer is we don't know who those people are or who they might be, but that would be determined at some point in the future as a function of the county clerk. Okay. All righty. I think that's that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Labeer. Um, would you mind? Commenting a little bit on the state is talking about raising revenue for transportation funding that might end up coming to local governments. They might do some sort of share back program. Is that how to describe that share back? Um, would you describe just if we would collect any of that money or if we'd have to refund that back? Uh, I can only describe to you what I've read in the newspapers and seen on television, which you have all seen, and my. Uh, vague secondhand understanding of this from those outlets is that um, there are some people collecting signatures. I have not been asked to sign anything as an individual voter, so I, I can't tell you that I've seen that. But my general understanding is that um, there may be a vote this year to increase the state sales taxes to fund various transportation projects, typically roads and bridges across Colorado. Um, and as a part of that, some money would come to the city, the cities across the state based on a formula of size and number of vehicles, a lot of different, a lot of different uh, elements to the, to the formula and that the city might receive some amount of money uh, related to that. I mean, I think I did about four what ifs in a row there. Um, but if all of that came to pass, as is rumored, um, that could mean uh, perhaps multi millions of dollars to the city. I will tell you that that will just increase the city's Tabor refund in the given year. So if last year the city got some million dollars in revenue related to such a thing, the refund would be a million dollars larger. This is basically what I can, can tell you. That happened, that's already happened uh, when the city uh, is collecting a portion of the faster income that we all pay on our Colorado registrations. Uh, that money is limited by Tabor and contributes to the refund as well. Great, thank you. And in the last, uh, how many refunds have we done uh, since the recession? Every what, year. What's the total amount? Do, oh. do you know? Uh, yes. Every year, thir 2013 through present, and uh, we've completed uh, some uh, over 16 million and uh, would add 12 million uh, five to that. And the grand total would be 29,373,000. Okay. I ask that because I think those things have an impact on our ability to have land acquisitions, property value, sidewalk, funding all those kind of things. So I just think it's important for people to know that 
well, I think we've been conservative, and I think that's been a benefit to the city in certain ways. In other ways, it hasn't, and some of that is that's the reason we lack infrastructure. That's the reason we have more land or less land acquisitions that we could have had otherwise. So thanks. So I just want to touch on something real quick, just for clarification. So there are two groups currently seeking signatures. One is Let's Go Colorado, and the other is Fix Our Damn Roads. Uh, Fix Our Damn Roads is a bonding mechanism um, seeking the legislature to set aside certain amount of <coughs> revenue each year for bonding purposes, strictly for highway. Uh, Let's Go Colorado is a separate breakdown of uh, highway funding and uh, multimodal and then it has a county and city distribution specific to it and that would be a 0 0.62 uh, 0 0.62 cent increase on sales tax the initiative will debruce the revenue that is allocated towards cities and counties uh, the, it's in the initiative and title that the revenue would be exempt from any spending revenue or other limits so we need to continue to check that but to on the early stages it's supposed to be that language is supposed to be in there if that helps thank you mayor i had yep. not uh i had not known those things I well and i think everybody's learning together so uh, ms gutwein thank you um so from looking at this slide that's up right now it looks like that we're projecting in 2020 about a four and a half million refund or I think it's four million. Okay. The difference between nine one fifty and. <laughs> okay, thank you. I I just wanted to check that that is, I mean that's a significant decrease from what we're expecting this year. It is. But the reason that it is so high this year is because of the replacement of vehicles and rooftops and mm -hmm. and uh, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the reason I'm asking is that you know as we're going through this process. Um, and as I'm talking to the community, I think one of the things that is important to them is that if this is about if the ballot there is a ballot question, um, it needs to be really clear where the money will go. People want to know exactly what the money is going to get used on. And so we have um, we've got these tiers, and they lay out really specific projects that are all in that twelve million dollar range. So what I'm asking about is, you know, let's say that this was a either a permanent debruce or let's say it was a five year or a ten year. Um, how can we communicate with the public about those other years, like next year and the year after that, so that it is transparent and clear what that money would be used for? But of course, we don't know exactly what those refunds are going to be. Would it be a percentage? Is that? I guess I'm asking the best possible way we can provide as much information without really knowing exactly what the refund would be sure well i think one way to do it is to lay it out as it is here you know clearly safe community quality living environment and quality transportation options are the focus of the recommendation of the committee and could be the focus of this city council and future city councils there's no doubt about that um, but quite honestly the refund could be zero at some point in the future as has already been discussed so I wouldn't want to create I would suggest not creating an unrealistic expectation in the public uh, for sure uh, but we think it's four million on an ongoing type basis and certainly I think it could be communicated to the public that we're gonna add 10 police agents we're committing to law enforcement professionals you know for their career at a level of service to the community that we want to commit to for the indefinite future so certainly in in this first year or two i think the council has the opportunity to be very specific and you know you've seen in my slides the names of parks and a description of restrooms and things like that it gets more difficult as time goes by and those future councils will you know have greater perhaps greater flexibility or less uh, if they don't have those taper refunds. So I think it's a balancing act and certainly up front That's a great idea. There are other communities that make no promises at all to the voters They've just said debrucing is or detabering is the right way to go and You know kind of trust us I think this strikes the better balance of being more descriptive and making some very firm commitments up front It's difficult to do 10 years from now. I think it's impossible to do 10 years from now 
Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Harrison. Um, thank you. Um, we just touched upon the fact that the reason why we have the increase this year is because of the hail. So right now there's not anything in the current Tabor law that says you could have a timeout due to disaster or anything like that, correct? No, there is nothing there. Uh, there are some elements of Tabor related to if the emergency reserve of the city is used. We did not do that uh, under the Tabor definition of emergency reserve. So, so to answer your question very simply, no. Okay. And I want to make sure that, that I'm understanding correctly. So based on an increasing economy, as we have right now, I'll, I'll call it that, um, not recession, that would be maybe the best. Any new service that we add, not only are we paying for that new service, but we're also refunding effectively the same cost because we're refunding money all the time. So that service is really costing us double based on what we're paying out versus and also the refund for that. Yeah, Am I that, saying that correctly? That can happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's really expensive for us to think about that way um, and I would say this I would echo um, exactly what um, Councillor Gutwein just said and that is I think a lot of people are very interested in this and would be understanding as long as there is a list a real strong list of bucket priorities of where it would go and um, be very accountable, very transparent where that money is going. What they don't want to see is the government not on a diet, let's just put it that way. And um, I think that we need to show programs that reflect exactly where that money is going. So. Okay. All right. Oh, I do have some more. Mm -hmm. Ms. Johnson? Thank you. Again, Councillor Harrison, I agree with you. People do need to have an honest description of how the money will be spent. But I also think there needs to be a date certain, a look back, if you will, how the money was spent and how much money came in. It can't just be put on an automatic pilot kind of a thing. That's my input on that. Also, on some of these Tier 1 projects, we've got for year-round restrooms. And some of these parks I'm not totally familiar with. Um, if they are pocket parks or neighborhood parks, I would least like us to look at the question, if you put a year-round restroom in, you also, we've got homeless issues. And that came up with Holbrook Park and the neighborhood would, would not support that kind of a thing. So that needs to be part of the discussion if we go forward on, on this. Also recently I asked about the highway user tax fund, which is what we pay at the pump for gas, and realized that not all of that money goes towards bridges and, and roads and highways. I think it's 10% is actually and I guess the legislature, in their wisdom, decided to siphon some of that off for other types of mobility, um, which I'm struggling with, because when you pay at the pump, you assume that that money's going for your roads, and that's not really the case. I've also was forced to go back into my stormwater file and got an old newspaper article here. Um, the stormwater fee was to tackle projects. It passed in 2016 on a 7-4 vote. And as you might expect, I was one of the four that voted against it. But I'd like to say that it did not have a date certain for a look back. I'm very uncomfortable putting things out there where you raise a fee in perpetuity and there's never any accountability down the road. And also, it was going to go up with inflation. So that's, I just want to get that out there. However, part of this also said that uh, there were approximately 
110 improvement projects that had been identified, uh, along with another 70 localized neighborhood drainage areas. Now, am I, did you say that we've already gotten five million? Is that right? From when the stormwater fee increased? Is that right? What I didn't hear for sure what what we've gathered since the increase. Big part, and I don't know the amount collected since the increase, but uh, the enterprise of stormwater management utility is certainly worthy of discussion and disclosure and look back. I don't know the. I know that the amount that we're collecting on an annual basis is about five to five and a half million. That was discussed earlier, um, but there certainly could be a reconciling and a look back on any of the city's programs and services in terms of what's been collected, what's been spent. Uh, you know, why have projects? Uh, been reprioritized or how far into them are we so certainly that can be done at any time in terms of uh, and should be a part of this uh, budget uh, very well in terms of uh, what's been completed and what hasn't since the fees increased i agree larry but the trouble is unless it's actually put in with the language at the time that it's adopted sometimes it just kind of goes on and on do we have any idea since we've collected the money if how many of these projects have been addressed or what's going on with the money that we've collected? I know I couldn't answer that tonight, but I think our city engineer and public works director could tell you to the nth degree of detail yeah. uh, what they were referring to upon the adoption of the rate increase and also what they were um, speaking about. Um, you know, most recently related to dry gulch or other initiatives. So they would be the ones to do that. Um, but you'll notice that it, none of those projects are related to what might be spent related to, um, you know, these, these community needs via a Tabor vote and so forth because those funds can't be used for those purposes. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. And, and I think that that was that next phase, absolutely, Ms. Johnson, as to where would that increase go? Would it be to help accelerate um, some of the larger projects, which is the Dry Gulch, I think if I'm thinking of the name accurately. And so that's going to come back because that'll be part of that. And part of the idea was would that delta of an increase be then bondable if this body says yes to accelerate 20 to $25 million worth of projects in that $100 million range or just keep kind of paying as we go with that increase so sounds like that's going to be coming back and um jay sent us their stormwater utility update from last year or from 2017 so i'll make sure that i resend that out tonight just in case there's a, a follow-up for that ms gutwein one more question about the topic of look backs other communities that have put ballot measures like this, do they typically include a time frame like a 10-year look back or are they typically just debrucing? There's been quite a mix. Uh, I can tell you that Lakewood had a timeout uh, last decade and uh, uh, during that period of time produced a communication each year as a part of the budget and separately in a looking at Lakewood issue, uh, I would contribute to that where we would continue to recalculate the city's Tabor refund and provide, even though it was hypothetical because we had this 10 year timeout and provide a description of what those funds were spent on for the benefit of the community to sort of shed light on what's happening, even though it was year four or five, it was a nine year timeout that the city had once before. Um, so it's a real mix. There are many, I, I will tell you, there is a significant number of cities in 1993, the first year of Tabor, that completely uh, debruced all of their revenues in perpetuity immediately and never dealt with uh, revenue limitations. Um, and that, that's kind of continued to grow. You've seen, I've seen cities across the front range who've done have taken similar paths as lake where they have a short-term timeout some revenue and then a mix of it and then ultimately come to the the point of having a, a permanent you know a permanent debrucing but with communication to the public as to what's kind of going on with those funds mm -hmm. okay great thank you and ms johnson it looks like roughly about 5.5 .5 million and it looks like we spent uh, half of that a little bit more than half so it looks like 
if I recall, they're banking that for the larger projects in anticipation of what this council does next on the stormwater. Okay, Mr. Uh, LeBeer. Uh, couldn't we also cap, or in the ballot language, isn't this a possibility that we could cap where we, how we use annualized expenditures? So for example, if we're adding 10 agents, we could limit that, like only 10% of this fund is going to go to annualized expenses. Couldn't we do something like that? I, I imagine that could be done legally and within the ballot language and so forth, but that could create some inflexibility that, that might not be best for the community, for the officers, and for the city council in the future. Um, I'm thinking of one example uh, that there was an election, not related to Tabor, but in the city of Aurora, that said there'd be a certain number of you know police officers, and those were great intentions, but over the course of decades out into the future it takes another election to change that either to increase or decrease i can't remember what was what was the outcome better or worse but um i think legally that could be done but that would create some fiscal complexity i think for the community out into the future would i, I don't think i would recommend that okay thanks okay so uh, let's get us close to to kind of some sort of idea on how to move forward and we have the recommendations of the budget and audit committee, which again is three, three uh, citizen members and three council members, Her council members, Harrison LeBeer and council member Beta. So is it fair to say we'll start from the furthest end and that is the fee or um, kind of the, the third tranche that we really didn't have presented due to the fact that it would create a tax increase. So is it fair to say that council does not want to go forward with that? Okay, so that's off the table. COPs, so COP and, and Tabor, is there consensus to move those two forward? Okay, go ahead, Ms. Franks. Well, help me understand. So moving them forward means that we're just progressing them to get deeper information into whether then later what we decide to put on the ballot, which could be individual, could be combined. So it's really more informational at this point yeah. to dig a little bit deeper to say and give our the public a chance to kind of weigh in. Would that so be fair? I agree, absolutely. So the, essentially what staff is looking for tonight is the um, some sort of direction to say, okay, we had our conversation, let's be done, or let's continue this conversation and to Councillor Johnson's question, maybe restrooms aren't what we want to see, you know, and so that's really will come to this group eventually, but the community needs to have more of an opportunity and the goal would to say, let's continue to have the, the um, staff work towards a potential ballot uh, initiative for debrucing. COPs could be that second part. The recommendation is just debruce from budget and audit. COP would be the second part, which could go to a vote of the people or could be done internally as well. So there's that, but this would continue that conversation, continue information, do surveys, and then um, have, you know, whatever, whatever we want to try to get out there for feedback from the community. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to go to our committee members. So, Mr. Beaton. Thank you, Mayor. Um, in thinking about this question, it, it required a certain amount of, I, I would call it soul searching on my part because I've always embraced Tabor, uh, kind of what uh, um, my co-counselor said about, uh, about keeping the government on a diet, and I like that idea, and I've always liked it. But I can also see that we've reached a point here where, one, we're talking about a lot of money. I mean, a significant amount of percentage of our budget here that we're going to be potentially refunding. And it's the people's money. And I kind of feel like they should have something to say about it. I almost feel, I, and I almost feel like I owe it to them to say, you really need to decide this. This is a big decision. This is a major decision. This isn't a day-to-day, week-to-week stuff that we do. This is a major decision. And I kind of feel like maybe the 
folks ought to have a chance to tell us what they want to do with that money because it's not just this year but it's in the coming years and it's been a lot you know it's been what uh, 12 years since we've addressed any Tabor issues so it's been quite a while that we've moved along and our city's getting larger our infrastructure is getting older um, our city's you know going through changes and as that happens we it just makes sense to come back and take another look and say hey uh, what, what do y'all want to do here so I, I guess I, I want to say that because I as I said it was a soul-searching thing for me but I'm in Inclined to at least take it out to the community get some feedback before we make a final decision but at least keep an open mind on it okay thank you um ms harrison thank you um i would agree i think this is incredibly important decision by the part of the citizens and we really need their input um what to do here because you're right it's not just pocket change anymore this this could do a lot both for them in terms of entities or embetterments, uh, whatever you want to call it, with the city itself. And I think we need to hear from them what they want us to do. I, I'm not comfortable in us making that decision any longer for them. I think this needs to go out to the citizens. Mr. LeBear. And to both of the previous counselors' points, um, I, uh, to summarize a little bit of what the, I think the committee said, and uh, you know, Councillor Bita and Councillor Harrison can definitely keep me honest on this. Um, we basically said, in my opinion, that we should take a much deeper dive on the COP conversation, and that that should probably come back um, to council for the ne our next strategic planning meeting, or we spend the next year having that conversation with people in the community. Um, in part because it's a lot bigger dollar figure and it'll have long-term ramifications. Um, so I think what we said was we should do a much deeper dive on that to Councillor Johnson's points about all these different things that are priorities. And, um, and then to the Tabor question, I think um, that was a little bit, I don't want to say it was easier, but I think some of that question was, well, this is something that we should send to the voters. Uh, Taper asks us if we want, uh, if there's a community need or if, if citizens want something um, from government, if they want more services, if they want more amenities, uh, that we should ask them. So I think the way we came up with, you know, sending uh, that question to the voters is that that's what Taper asks us to do, so we should do it uh, if there is a community need or if the community uh, believes there's sufficient need. So. I think that's what I got from the committee, and uh, hopefully that helps clarify some things. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. This is the last time I'll speak on this. You're fine. <laughs> okay. First, I want to say Tabor is actually not my strength. Um, I think it's incredibly complicated, and the more that I know, the more I know I don't know. Um, and when Tabor was first voted on, there were good intentions. Um, it was to require government to be cautious. And I agree with that. Um, as candidates, it's always fun to run on something that you've gotten funded. And I think that's gotten, gotten us all into trouble, frankly. Um, I've been spending the afternoon going back in time and looking at Tabor and all of the years that it's been in place. And one of the things that I ran into was referendum C that, oh my goodness, what date, what, it's been several years. And there were, it passed. But it, the folks were promised that it was going to go towards transportation. And in the end, it went towards education and Medicaid. And so there were, there were feelings of angst, to be honest with you. And coming from the state legislative side, I can understand how that would have happened. Medicaid is on a, uh, its own trajectory, and you've got to fund it, period. And to be honest with you, education's got that same kind of earmark in the Constitution. We've kind of goofed on a few things. Uh, Tabor is not perfect. Um, 
We've got a healthy reserves, 30 million. Um, and there are some things that simply none of us can do alone. You've got to pool your money. We can't individually play, pay for a, a policeman. We've, we've got to have the money to do uh, our safety, our parks, and frankly, our potholes. Those are the three priorities for a municipal government, or the three Ps. I agree with going forward with this, with the conversation. There are things in this document that are defined as priorities. I'm not sure that the public sees it that way. And we've got to, all of us, take the time to take this to our wards, and as you mentioned, Mayor, to have community outreach, however that happens, on the web and maybe looking at Lakewood, to see what the people define as the priorities and where they're seeing the deficits. And for me, the final product on this, I'm assuming it will probably end up on the ballot, frankly, is that uh, it must have a date certain of when it's going to end or for a look back. I cannot support something that it just goes in perpetuity. And once the projects are done, you know, then where's the money going to go? And uh, we have to have a defined stop date on this and also exactly how that money is going to be spent. Based on what happened with referendum C, you can see why the, po why the people don't have a lot of trust in in uh, folks that are defining governance and elected, frankly. So yes, we need to go forward with this, but we also need to get community input. Well said. Uh, Ms. Franks. So I, I'm definitely in support of moving this forward. The one thing that I would just like us all to be cognizant of is that while for maybe some of us who have two incomes, you know, we're talking about refunds, $100, which for some of us is, is not a big deal. But I want us to make sure that we keep in mind that the cost of living for some of our folks in our community that are on fixed incomes, these decisions uh, can make the difference between them being able to stay in their homes and not. So over time, I'd like us to start tracking the cumulative effect of our decisions on folks on fixed income so we can see where we may be needing to find some creative strategies to release those burdens. I just think we have to keep that in mind. I mean, I, at this point, I just know that when I was campaigning, there was folks barely hanging on then, and now we have the property taxes increasing, which I know a majority doesn't come to the city. It goes to the school districts. But I just think we need to kind of understand what we what our impacts are more broadly so we can also look for, well, can we then reduce fees at our centers for seniors? Or how, what, what can we do to, to, to kind of bring down those costs or at least not keep increasing them across the board? So I just wanted to add that to the discussion. Ms. Gutwein. Uh, well said to everybody. I, I think um, I agree with a lot of what's been set up here, and um, I, I don't feel prepared to move forward in the short term on the COP conversation, but I think in the long term that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I absolutely think we need to send this out to the community and get more feedback about um, what they see as the priorities. This is their money, and you know we hear a lot of things that they'd like to see in the community and ultimately it's their money they should get to decide how it gets spent. Um, one thing I would like to have as part of that process um, and I think it was listed in the tier two conversations but maybe not in the tier one is um, one of the biggest things I hear about is park acquisition and just making sure we can find a way even if we don't explore COPs and however we do it if there's a way that we can um, continue to purchase parks and set aside some of that money that can only be used for that because um, just as we're seeing the growth pressures I think this is on the forefront of people's minds right now um, so that's something that I'd really like to make sure um, at least gets out out to the community and see if that's a if that's what they would like to see um, and again I, I think that I would just like to thank um, everyone who participated in this and then think that anything that we can do to continue our, our record of accountability and trust and um, transparency with our dollars through this process will 
will be helpful in the long run. So thank you. Okay. So Miss Hodson, do you have enough um, kind of direction as to where to go? And the one question I did have, I mean, you, you mentioned the non-scientific. Is there a method we could try to do a more scientific survey to get a better understanding? We actually, there isn't, frankly, there isn't enough, enough time, time to do a survey and to have the results in time for you to make that decision, which would be important. Um, but we can instead reach out as as many ways as we can. Um, there are kind of old-fashioned ways to do it. I was thinking maybe maybe we set aside like a phone mail, a phone mail box. Maybe that's a way some people want to communicate. Certainly we can do a survey on the website. We can um, distribute information out however you're interested. I know Mr. Doerr did a white paper um, that's been really helpful. A lot of people have commented on, on how um, detailed and um, valuable that was so we can make sure that's available in hard copy or at least cite it through the website so we have a communications team that's been working diligently on this trying to um, approach this and in, in as many ways as possible but a, a scientific survey is isn't something we can do well your, your, your team's done an excellent job with with some of the web platforms so thank you and I think if we continue to utilize those is because it something and, and maybe mr. Cox is this something within the law could council do telephone town halls to try to reach a broader audience I see miss Hodson wasn't a big fan of that <laughs> uh, yeah I'm not sure what you how you define the television uh, telephone town hall uh, but the bottom line is until you've set the, the question for the ballot there are options for uh, taking the public temperature if you will the restrictions come in when you've got a ballot question and the my concern is our bandwidth only goes so far I mean we have our ward meetings which you know tend to grow but you're still only reaching a finite amount of people and um, shy of having you know open houses throughout all the community maybe that's an option that we could look at and and create it in a platform that's more just feedback you know to to have you know this is what it is basically this presentation potentially and then we can gauge that feedback coming in but i i think as many touch points as we can get that's going to help this council make a better decision as to what the community wants and where the community wants to go with that so if that's something we don't have to say that's what we're going to do, but if that's something we want to explore, we can add that to our bucket list. Okay. Ms. Vincent? Should we just, sorry. Should we just take off, I mean, I take it we can use the information we got tonight to go out to folks, but should we make an agreement that we just take off the Tier 3? Because I think that will confuse people if we do that. Well, and, and I think it's fair to say maybe we should take off two as well as what I'm gathering. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, just, so, okay. just Tier 1. All right, so just Tier 1. Just Tier 1. Okay. okay. So is, is that, is that f fair uh, direction, Ms. Hodson? Yeah, and maybe we can adjust the information so that you don't have Tier 2 so it doesn't create a confusion. Um, so we'll just net Tier 2 out and even the, the little note on Tier 3 so that you can grab that and use that information. And, and if we could have a check-in, I think um, we don't have a lot of time. So maybe a check-in within a month even, just a quick update at council meetings or updates as they come as to what we're doing and where the feedback is, that'd be super helpful. Yeah, I can provide that during my executive report. Mr. LeBeer? Uh, with that, the tier one, tier two thing, I also, just, but we do want to make sure, right, that like things like land acquisitions that I think is in tier two, that it's also has a potential option in tier one. So I want to add, just want to add that. All right. Mr. Doerr, you did a fantastic job. Thank you, and uh, thank you to our citizens and our committee members who spent a lot of time. But this was a, a very well done presentation this evening. And I wanna commend council as well. Talking about this subject is not easy, but at the beginning of the year, you said this was a priority and we echoed it as a bold move in 2018. And, and who knows where it will go, but I really want to thank this, this body and, and the folks who weren't here who were also able to, to weigh in 
and have been a, a big part of this. Thank you for all this time and energy devoted to this issue. Um, really looking at ways to pay it forward. Okay. So we will go to reports. And I just have a couple things. I need a housekeeping, actually. <laughs> and uh, if, our, if our Madam Clerk... <laughs> yeah, that too. <laughs> Madam Clerk, this is really geared towards your office. We need clarification of who is on the drafting committee from each ward. So from Ward 1, who's on the drafting and who's on the housing? Councillor Johnson is on housing. I'm housing. So Councillor Abel is drafting. Develop, or the development is what I... Th yeah, kind of. Uh, the one that Councillor Skilling recommended. Gotcha. Yep. That's That's, that's Councillor Abel. Okay. Ward 2. Housing. Housing is Vincent. Development. Development. Okay. Ward 3. I don't know. <laughs> well, now you get okay. to choose. Drum roll. I'll do development. Okay, so Councilor Bita drafting. No, Councilor, that that that's it. How, the housing is so housing is looking at the different housing options that we have and what can we utilize. Where do we have to? What should we be adjusting? What do we want to see more of? The drafting, as I would call it, as Councilor Skilling is kind of taking all of the feedback that we're getting and trying to churn out a better product before it comes to us. So housing? Yep. Drafting. Ms. Franks? Housing. You're housing. She's off of committees. So housing. She's housing. <laughs> um, and five? I'm drafting development. Drafting. Housing. All right. Awesome. Thank you. First Friday. That was incredible if you made it out, especially to the art line and got to see all the wonderful things and the dinosaur flash mobs and new people that I've never seen before, young and old in the city of Lakewood. So that was really cool. Uh, the official kickoff for the art line is gonna be this Saturday at Mount Air Park. I think it starts at noon. And um, this is uh, Lakewood Inspires Arts Week. So there's all kinds of fun things going on. You can go to lakewood.org slash inspire to find out about all the wonderful activities and if you've heard of Den Denver Cruisers, which is a very popular uh, bicycle ride in Denver, they're bringing it to Lakewood, and that's going to kick off at 9.30 a.m. somewhere on West Colfax and end up over at Mount Air this Saturday. Um, let's see here. I think that that is it for me. I just want to make uh, two more comments. Councillor Johnson mentioned, you know, referendum C and where the money went, and that's why one of these ballot initiatives is actually a dedicated amount of money that is only for transportation. And that's where we have run into a lot of issues is the discretionary ability of the state legislature to move those dollars around. So that's what we're kind of trying to, to stop. And I encourage people to get involved as these conversations continue. And finally, we had two police agents injured, a police agent and a police sergeant injured, injured in an early morning incident at one of our motels a couple weeks ago. Luckily, they're both doing okay. We continue to send them our thoughts and prayers. But just to reiterate, this body is sick and tired of the behavior at some of these motels and hotels. And there will be soon coming to this body the opportunity to start to rein that in. So I think we would like to echo to those owners. We appreciate if you would be a better part of our community, and we welcome that. And if you don't, we will do it for you. So that's all we got for me. Mr. Royball? No comment. Uh, Mr. LeBeer? So I don't have a lot to report, but I just wanted to add, I worked on the Referendum C campaign, and... Uh, we got a lot of projects done, including Highway Exit 182, which I was pretty proud to see get completed. It was $5 billion. It was the estimated projection, but um, a recession happens, and it was only a five-year timeout, so FYI. Ms. Harrison? Um, we had a very successful Ward 5 meeting. Um, we were kind of, uh, we started the discussion about uh, municipal funding and had kind of a, uh, um, 
lower level discussion about what could be and what how it would work and one of the fe the feedback that we got from our ward 5 people is we we'd consider it if we knew exactly where the money was going so uh, it was it was an excellent um, discussion and we had probably somewhere between 50 and 60 people there so it was a good good discussion thank you That's a good one. I'll just quickly echo that and say that uh, we started out by talking about how money is one of the top five things that married couples fight about and that's when you choose each other and you choose to spend your whole life together um, and so the fact that we had such a really respectful and robust conversation with the community and no one got mad at each other um, I think it just I really appreciate everyone who came and everyone who's participated in this conversation um, I'm I'm proud of all of us for having the tough con conversations and getting what our community wants to see on the table. So thank you. Ms. Franks. I uh, just wanted to remind folks that this Saturday, 9.30 to 11 at Green Mountain Presbyterian Church will be our Ward 4 meeting. Um, after all the normal introductions and announcements, we're going to take some time to um, solicit input from the audience as far as what presentations they may want to see. We have a lot of different city services and departments, and uh, I know that Wards uh, 1 and 5 have had some really good seminars from different groups, and so we just want to understand uh, which one may be of interest to our community um, also of course we'll be talking about Tabor um, so we'll make sure that that's on the agenda and then I'm hoping to have an update uh, about the Morrison kind of IGA and all of that um, so I'm putting that out there that I'd like to have some talking points and some updates to be able to give to our community on Saturday thank you thanks mr. Bita no report ms. Vincent I just I just want to piggyback on the um, first Friday it was it was just it was wonderful and I think sometimes it's important to get other people when you're well, I've been heavily involved in it you know some of us have um, to get outside opinions and my sister came and she ran the Boulder Boulder and she says I've got to see this green line thing you've been talking about for so long so we drove around and her opinion was she goes I never thought this neighborhood that you lived in would come to this she goes this is great and she went home and told all her friends about it so I thought that was really cool I was really touched by that so Ms. Johnson Thank you. I'd like to publicly thank Ben Goldstein. He went above and beyond to help me with the venue for an outside speaker who came and talked about Korea. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of the Korean vets that came to that. The Korean War has been called the Forgotten War, but it is clear in Lakewood and in this community the people that served and that died over there are not forgotten. Uh, Saturday, Ward 1 had its first picnic, and I'd very much like to openly thank Pete. He brought his five-burner grill <laughs> and uh, uh, grilled hamburgers and hot dogs, and it, it was more than I expected. We had 75 people. I couldn't believe it, and uh, we'll obviously be doing that again. And I'd also like to say I've been talking with Charlie on a daily basis, and uh, of course the question came up about flowers or charities that kind of thing if somebody would like to do anything in memory of Tammy he requests that you give money to the foothills animal shelter because uh, she was a great lover of animals of all kinds thank you that's it thank you so much all right well we appreciate that and uh, we will adjourn at 9 12 p.m. thank you <laughs>